government forces children to harvest the crop. How about that? Now, Swedish high street retailer H&M and sportswear companies Adidas and Puma were among the brands who pledged not to buy cotton uh, that they know has been collected by children. The groups have signed a pledge under the Responsible Sourcing Network. And just to recall, the move is the second victory of this month for human rights groups over the Uzbek regime. On September 9th, organizers of the New York Fashion Week, under pressure from the media and rights groups, cancelled a show by the eldest daughter of Uzbek President Islam Karimov. But she moved on and did the show anyway in a very upscale restaurant in uh, New York. So uh, not much of a boycott there because people did go and did appreciate her work. Now this is just bad timing. It always rains when you least want it to. Heavy monsoon rains are hampering teams trying to reach survivors across isolated Himalayan regions in India, Nepal and Tibet after a magnitude 6.9 earthquake struck the area on Sunday. Now the epicenter was the northern Indian state of Sikkim where the Indian government says that at least 35 people have been killed but the relief efforts there have been hampered by rainfall and landslides. You can see the terrain on the screens. Now it is feared that the toll could rise. Now this is not the first of such incidents this year. Several earthquakes hit the region but none caused major damage. Thick cloud and heavy rain is making it difficult for rescuers as Indian military helicopters have been unable to take off and aid workers are stranded trying to reach the affected areas. Really reminds me uh, of uh, the 2005 earthquake here in Pakistan as well. Even then it was the same story. Uh, very difficult terrain and very, very difficult to reach uh, people who were really in need. Okay, you might enjoy this story now. Talk about getting a cold response. Leading UK polar scientists say the Times Atlas of the world was wrong to assert that it has had to redraw its map of Greenland due to climate change. Now, publicity for the latest edition of the Atlas said warming had turned 15% of Greenland's former ice-covered land uh, green and ice-free. But scientists from the Scott Polar Research Institute say the figures are wrong. In fact, the ice has not shrunk so much. Which is rather strange because we keep hearing how much the ice has shrunk. Now, what is ironic is that the Atlas costs £150 and claims to be most authoritative in the world. The 13th edition of the comprehensive version of the Atlas includes a number of revisions made for reasons of environmental change since the previous one published in 2007. But if this report is to be believed, it now appears that a 14th edition might be coming very soon because I don't know how could they say that, you know, it has shrunk when it hasn't at all. I'm so glad that there are watchdogs, there are groups who are on the lookout of uh, any such happenings and they actually point it out. So the atlas probably is not as correct as we thought it to be. Now the, the age-old battle between science and religion still rages on. Sir David Attenborough has weighed into a campaign calling for creationism, creationism to be banned from the school science curriculum and for evolution to be taught more widely in schools. Now just so that you understand what we are talking about, Creationism is the religious doctrine opposed to naturalistic evolution that life on this planet was created by a special unique act of God. Now Sir Attenborough, the naturalist, joined three Nobel laureates and other leading scientists in calling on the government to tackle the threat of creationism and Gordon Brown's government had issued guidance to all schools that the subject should not be taught to pupils but neither they nor the present coalition government enshrined their recommendations in law. What is interesting is that it is still uh, under debate. They can actually talk about things that might, you know, certainly go slightly against what people's perception of religion is. Um, only in the West can they do that. At least talk and come to a conclusion. Nowhere else in the world, I would think. At least, you know, um, not in this part of the world. No. In fact, I shouldn't even have said that. Now, planning to watch a movie, are you? Well, the weekend is still uh, a couple of days uh, away, but you know, you can still listen to what we have to tell you. Now, we have one movie for you, which goes by the name of 
Where Do We Go Now? And this is a comedy set in war-torn Lebanon. It has won the People's Choice Award at Toronto International Film Festival, which is a very big deal. Now, the film tells of a group of women determined to keep the men in their village out of a religious war. The award was voted for by festival audiences and it includes a $15,000 prize money. Other films eligible for the award included two George Clooney movies, so that is some competition I must say and these movies were The Dissidents and The It Is Of March and the movie has been uh, directed by 37 year old Nadine Labaki who also stars in it. There she is on the screens and previous winners of the People's Choice Award including The King's Speech and Slumdog Millionaire have gone on to Academy Award success as well so you never know about this one. I'm quite curious, you know, I am going to be watching it. By the way, if you guys wonder where I look when I look on my side, there's a screen here on my left side and I, I also want to see, you know, what we are showing to you. So, yeah, that is what I'm doing. Now, we often hear about people getting injured in bar brawls, but this next one is very different. At least 36 people were killed after unidentified gunmen opened fire at a crowded bar near the Burundi capital, Bujumbura. One survivor said that he heard someone some distance away shout, kill them all, and then the gunmen opened fire. Now the worst part was that the local hospital was reportedly unable to cope with the wounded as dead bodies were left in a car park. Burundi's last rebel group officially laid down its arms in 2009, but sporadic attacks have continued and the government has blamed recent attacks on bandits but some fear a new rebel group has emerged okay so we are going to take a very short break when we come back we are talking about uh, a very interesting uh, organization which goes by the name of Ahan but we have more details of that later <laughs> Welcome back everyone. Now TMS viewers are a witness to the number of artists we have had on our show over the years. A lot of the times their wares have been made in the name of some distinct area of Pakistan or even a distinctive craft. Today we present to you the real deal. Ahan, short for Ek Honar Ek Nagar, is a not-for-profit company which provides support to poor producer groups, artisans and craftsmen by facilitating them in product development, quality assurance, marketing and a lot more. I could go on in detail about how it works but we will let the CEO of Ahan, Mr. Maruf Afsal, do the talking who joins me this morning along with one of the consultants uh, who worked with Ahan, Ms. Nurjaha Bilgarami, who is a renowned uh, artist, textile designer, author and a well-known revivalist. Yeah. Good morning. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? Fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming here. And uh, let me also tell our viewers that uh, we are surrounded by a lot of things uh, that Ahan uh, makes and produces. Uh, Mr. Maruf, I'll start with you. If you could explain uh, a little bit in semi-detail what Ahan is actually. Well, Ahan's concept is based on one village, one product, which is there in Thailand. And this has been indigenized in Pakistan. The idea behind this uh, com uh, the performance of this company is that it works mostly in rural areas of Pakistan and whatever crafts exist in Pakistan, those are contemporized, okay. the products are diversified and they are made for the high-end markets because mostly people who are living in the rural areas, they don't have access to good designs, good raw material, mm. to artists, to input of professionals. So we in fact provide them uh, leverage, kind of, we bridge them with the high-end market and we make the, the products which are acceptable in the local and international market also and we are working on in different sectors we can it, these are uh, textile leather then uh, masri woodwork woodwork well, lacquer art well. so any kind of art which is existing in pakistan we have so far identified more than 672 clusters oh, all wow. over pakistan 
Um, it is very interesting that you are saying that because I have also noticed that some of uh, the artists who do amazing work uh, don't realize their own talent because it hasn't been appreciated. So that's that's a great way of appreciating them as well. That is true because uh, I said that they don't have access to the mm. uh, good professionals. And our work comprises mostly of textile because we work in rural areas with the women folk. So they are about 70-80% of our artisans and we are now working with more than 30,000 artisans in Pakistan. So that's a big number. Absolutely. So if we absolutely. Can streamline their production hmm. and we make the timely production, quality production, they have a lot of acceptability. We have tried and tested foreign markets also through some of the exhibitions that there was a, the, the things were in great demand. All right. So we are trying to develop on that and we're trying to tap new markets for these artisans which can I am sure change life of these rural uh, folk. Oh absolutely and I'm sure that is the hope as well. Ms. Nooja you have been uh, working in collaboration you've, you've been consulting uh, for yes. uh, uh, Ahan mm -hmm. as well for a long time. You have a big name in the industry <laughs> as well especially with block prints and natural dyes. Uh, are you in sync with what Ahan does and obviously because you have a first hand knowledge of working with these, uh, these talented people I would say. I don't know about sync, I'm sure we must be in sync so that it continued. Uh, yes, my background has been a lot to do with revival of uh, indigenous crafts, particularly textiles. And Ajrak, me being in Sindh, was one of the textiles that I had documented intensively, written a book That's and made exactly. a documentary film. This is all prior to my working on this project. And that's why I had felt very comfortable and I requested Ahan rather than looking at a in you know different this thing i'll just take ajrak as one component and would like to make a, my contribution in how design intervention can bring a change because ajrak was being its usage and its making was restricted to its um, being made as a chadar basically and as tablecloth but in the indigo and madder which was also again chemical dyes okay so i wanted to go back into time and say that Earlier, Ajrak was always made in natural dyes, hmm. prior to the introduction of chemical dyes. So it was really working within the framework and having had the uh, you know, detailed knowledge and experience of working with the craftsmen and their problems, it was easier for me to work as in as a consultant for this particular interesting project. so before uh, you know ahan came into the picture and uh, i i would say that uh, you know gathered all these and uh, made a liaison between you know the customers and uh, people who are actually working uh, was there a great demand for these artisans and their work are you talking about uh, ajrak particularly uh, let's take ajrak for uh, instance. let's take ajrak for not in the um, not uh, at all in the urban areas Ajrak, unfortunately, even now, if you go and look at it, there's a, literally in um, the old part in the Lee Market, there's a small shop which you can find Ajrak. So if you want to go and buy mm. Ajrak, the only way you could do it was to reach to the villages and get it from there. Right, right. So it wasn't made, um, you know, that accessible. accessible. Mm. And apart from that, Ajrak as it was in the, as a chadar form, had uh, its restricted usage. Mm -hmm. So my idea was to introduce uh, it on different material and that's what, what I'm wearing is Ajrak okay. right now. And this that's is natural dyes hmm. also. And because we think of Ajrak on only one color. That's what I was, wanted to explain hmm. to you and I'm particularly wearing this to explain. And none of these are designs from anything else but their own uh, vocabulary. All right but it was softening it out um, into our usage into a contemporary use by introducing it on fabric mm. which we can wear or it can be you know has more multiple usage exactly and uh, making use of our natural dyes mm. so it is from the roots of plants or leaves and bark that you get color and uh, so reintroducing that, so it's also eco And natural friendly. dyes are durable as well? Absolutely. This has been washed in washing machine <laughs> okay. many times, oh, lovely. for example. Very yeah. nice. Um, Mr. Maruf, I'll come back to you now. Uh, you know, this is one example right here in front of us. And of course, we have a lot of other examples as well. Uh, 
Is it surprising uh, to find, uh, you know, dyeing arts in Pakistan and, you know, works of art as well, and not just in clothing, in, in as you said, in pottery and in woodwork and leather, and uh, how satisfying is it to, you know, just bring it back? Well, uh, you rightly said that Pakistan, in Pakistan we have many dyeing arts, and primarily because people don't find uh, a good market for that. They do, do have skill. Their skill has not been developed and the markets have not been tapped. But it's a, it's a matter 